So just to give you some context of the relationship with, um, with uh, the Warhol Foundation, I arrived in Boone in 1993. This is my 30th year at Appalachian. And I arrived at the university um, to work on my master's degree. And the work that I was really researching and studying and interested in at that time was the relationship artists had with the earth, the earth as an art medium. And so the artists that we all knew about were people like Michael Heiser, Christo, and Robert Smithson. Um, I sometimes get invited to be on Christo panels because I'm usually the only person who says anything mean about it. So, um, so the reason I was looking at those artists was, what does that talk about the relationship? So you see the Michael Heiser, pe Heiser piece, it's 1,500 feet long, dug out of a section of the earth with moving equipment. I mean, it's a very aggressive mark on the land. Um, Christo's piece is 24 and a half miles long. They had to end up negotiating migratory paths for animals who couldn't get where they needed to get and ocean things, there were lots of things like that. And then the Smithson piece is 1,500 feet long in the Great Salt Lake. And it actually is one of those that really takes advantage of the environment that it's at. And that's one of the reasons why it's cited there. But there are very large gestures. And so I began to um, look at other artists that, and how their relationship worked with, it, with the land. And this is Dana Mendieta, who is a Cuban-American artist. And um, these are from her Silhouette series. And as you can see, they're much smaller in scale, more intimate, more um, about, um, she actually, in both of those, the one on the left is made by her in the sand, and the one on the right is her with the tree. And so the artist is actually in the environment, part of the work, and began to see this shift of, um, of being something that was transitory, as opposed to this large mark that would stay there for, for you know, decades and eons. So. Uh, this is Nancy Holt on the left. Those are sun tunnels, and they are um, four 18-foot long concrete tubes that are aligned with the summer and winter solstice. So on those particular dates, the sun rises and sets in those circles of the tubes, and then there are constellations drilled in the tubes around. So as the, the sun moves, it shows these constellations inside. So whenever you're there, it's a different experience, depending on what time you're there. And the piece on the right um, Dominique Mazod. Um, she was born in France. She lives in Santa Fe, been there for many years. It was really funny. She was one of the artists we had here for a panel. I, I invited people to attend. And she was from France and she kept talking about my accent and how cute it was. And I had to say, I'm sorry, but you're the one with the accent. Everybody else here sounds like me. <laughs> so, so, she, so every now and then when we talk, she says, I still have my accent, do you? And, um, but this is the great cleansing of the Rio Grande River, and it was one of her projects that was seven years long. She got up every day and picked up trash and documented that trash and then exhibited it as part of her work. She did other things as well, but that whole um, idea of bringing, the artist bringing a community's awareness to something that was going on in the community. So these are all things that are floating around. Um, so Touch Santa Station on the left is Meryl Latterman Euclides from New York. And she is um, unofficially, means she's not paid, but she is the, depart the artist in resident for the New York Department of Sanitation. Sounds glamorous, doesn't it? And um, the piece on the left is called Touch Sanitation. She spent 11 months going to every garbage worker in New York City and saying, thank you for taking care of the mess we make. Um, you know, and respecting them because she remembered in, in growing up in, in, in the Bronx, people chasing garbage men off with brooms and, and she was like, wait a minute, they're cleaning our mess. This is our stuff and they're taking. So she did this project for 11 months and got to, to know them and she still works with them throughout these last 40 years almost. The image on the right is called the social mirror. It's a piece she created for, with the Department of Sanitation. It's a dump truck that has mirrors on it. So when it drives through the street, instead of rolling your nose up and saying, hey, look at the dump truck, you see yourself in it because that's what the dump truck is. It's us. And so, um, so she's very kind of um, interesting, poetic, but very sharp in her critique of, of our society. The bottom piece is Fresh Kills Landfill, which is huge. You see, I think it's 2,200 acres and it's full. <laughs> so what do you do with a landfill that's full? And Meryl said, I think we make art on it. So, um, so there's been a long process over the years with her creating artworks and reclaiming spaces um, that were used. She's, but she's great, and I've, I've, done lot, I've got lots of information on her. She was in my thesis work, so. Uh, this is Danny Park in Cambridge. It was another uh, dump site that was just a dump right behind a neighborhood that um, people were not, you know, it was just, a, it was just un, uh, lost land. And so the, she created these, she calls them smellers and wavers, <laughs> weeds that move and some that have scents. And the, um, 
the beautiful asphalt there is actually, she calls it glass fault. And it's small ground pieces of glass that's been embedded. So it creates this really spark. They're all recycled materials, recycled tires, recycled asphalt, and recycled glass that creates these amazing paths that go through the, the site. So um, while I was thinking about all these artists and, um, and working on my thesis, uh, I, I proposed that we do an exhibition at, here at the university called Views from Ground Level. Um, art and ecology in the late 90s and it was based on the work that I was doing with my thesis and so I wrote a grant for this. This is now you can see, now you can see where it all ties together. I do ramble but I really have a direction this time. So this, uh, I wrote a grant for this exhibition to the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts because I was young, I was a graduate student and why not? You know, just write the biggest one you can write. You know, call them, send them cards, talk to them and um, so <laughs> So I sent off a proposal for this exhibition, and um, it didn't get funded. But when I got into the office, which, uh, which is an affectionate term, it was the janitor's closet in Schaefer Center at the top of the stairs was my office. And I had a note on my office saying to call Pamela Clapp, the director of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. And so I, I called, and she said, um, I just wanted to let you know what an amazing proposal that was. I see you're a graduate student. We never get proposals from graduate students. Keep doing it. We only had a small amount of money that we could do. We had these projects. We had some priorities. But I wanted you to know that we seriously considered your project, and you should keep doing things like this. And I said, great. Do you mind if I come and see you when I'm in New York? And she said, absolutely not. She did know I'd do it. But um, I, I, I traveled pretty regularly to New York in those days because we did a lot of shows and works with galleries there. And I always made a point to visit um, their, their offices and show them what we were doing and talk about um, the work at Appalachian and the community we had here. So um, the piece you see here on the left and right is called Prima Lingua by Jackie Bruckner. She was one of the artists that I featured in the exhibition. And she, um, what we did was we tailored this for our area. She created a sculpture of a human tongue um, using lava rocks. The taste buds are actually um, um, lava rock that's been chiseled into the size of the taste buds as they move. It's a very intense process. Um, and, and it's set in concrete on a steel base. And so, um, so what we did was we went to the Watauga River and we collected water that was near runoff areas. We tested and found some of the areas that had the highest level of contaminants. We collected that water and we brought it in and we put it in the gallery in the fountain. And then we um, seeded the tongue with moss spores because moss is a natural cleanser. That's what moss does in the rivers. It's, when you see it, you think, ah, it's, it's feeding things and it's cleaning the water. So we put them, we put seeded it with just moss, you know, draped it on there. And then as the polluted water ran over the tongue, the moss grew, clean more water. We would have the biology department come in and test the water. And as they tested it, when it got clean, we would take it back to the river and return it and collect some more water. And we did this for the whole time of the exhibition. Um, Denise, prob uh, were you here when we did this one? She probably remembers one night, somebody got very excited and knocked one of the tubes off. And the water uh, migrated down the hall of the, uh, of the Schaefer Center and we had to kind of regather it up. But, um, but you can see that the tongue can grow all these things just with what's in the water and how it's pulling it out. So it was a great piece and um, it kind of really helped her launch some of her work as well. So after we did that ex exhibition, that was in the 90s based, uh, based on that work, um, I continued to visit, talk to them about what we were doing, um, talk to them when we got our building, the, the, the Methodist Church, the old Methodist Church, the, old, the new old Methodist Church on King Street, and let them know what we were doing. And uh, so then after the last visit, we, when we opened that first portion, she, they had seen that we opened the building and I sent them um, attendance numbers and show records and all the things we were doing. Uh, they called and said, um, we'd like to come for a site visit. And I said, well, first off, you do know we're two hours away from the nearest airport. And um, that's the conversation you always have to have with folks. And they understood and they came down and spent a day with us. So we were in between, we had the, new, the renovation done on the left and the new building was being constructed on the right. And so they came in between that process while that one was being constructed. And we spent uh, a good bit of time with them during the day. And at the end of the day, um, 
they turned to me and said, what would you do if we gave you $50,000? And I said, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> I'm all, if you're going to do it, always be prepared for that question. Let me tell you, have a list your entire life. If your parents have, have a list. <laughs> always have a list. It may be a different list for different people, but have a list. And so I rattled off this, this, this vision I had for a sculpture show, which was kind of in both wings of the building and really looked about how we redefine space and thought about space. And um, the next week they called and said, we're sending you a check for $50,000. And so um, it funded that exhibit um, in our new wing and our uh, renovated wing called Redefining Space. And the other thing you do, Every time I say, I use the complete phrase, made possible by a grant from the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. Thank people all the time. I never, I never go without saying that. And um, so every chance I can, I always mention that because it helps their work and it helps your work as well. So um, one of the first artists we had in that exhibition um, in our new wing was Julianne Swartz. And I found her work um, doing some research and going to New York and visiting galleries and, um, and did not know she is the daughter of one of my best friends, other best friends. And so uh, after we secured her for the exhibition, she was selected for the Whitney Biennial. So it was a great thing because we, you know, we, had, we had this artist who, um, you know, had got, who got a great deal of recognition and so came to us with that. And this is called Manage Flow Ecosystem. And it's really funny. Uh, you know, I, after 30 years, um, I you know, have worked with almost everybody in every department on campus. And the physical plant gentleman could not believe that I had just gotten a brand new building and I was asking them to cut holes in the wall and run water pipes in different places than we had water pipes. But they did it and, um, and were a great help. And so what we actually did was created this series of ecosystems with water and plants and um, how people move through it, the sound. It was curated based on sound. She does a lot of sound work, site-specific work. And so it really helped us talk about sustainability, which is a key core principle at Appalachian, one of our things that we talk about a lot and do work with. And so um, her work was great. You see there's a little drip there. We always love that photograph. She, she like did all the studies of viscosity and, um, and, uh, and peripheral dripping and how things would drip and where they would fall. So she would make these little cuts to um, kind of keep things going throughout the exhibit. This is Stefan Hindi, who was uh, the second artist in our new wing at uh, that time. And this is called Some Zombies Stayed Home at night, Last Night and Did Nothing. So I, I said, I think it would now be called Some Zombies, Netflix and Chill, is what it'd be called these days. But um, he, uh, the, 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 uh, this is the other one, the physical plant says, oh, this is why you wanted a, uh, electrical outlets in the wall every five feet, I mean in the floor every five feet. And I said, exactly. So um, this piece had no external lighting. It was all lit by the actual sculptures themselves. And um, he uh, really was interested in most of his places that were very cave-like. And this piece was one where he wanted to bring an outside environment to an inside space and kind of use it to, to reconfigure how we thought about outside and inside. They're really beautiful. And it's um, corrugated, corrugated plastic with um, graphic tape. And it's as labor intensive as it looks, but it was great. We have some small wooden structures that support the whole overall things. And then they have lighting, lighting structures inside. And we have gels on the lights like you use in the theater to change the light colors. This is Laura Amison, who was in the, in the renovated wing in her exhibition. And Laura's work um, had been re relatively small scale up until this point, and our grant gave her the opportunity to do a larger um, project and really kind of take over this space. She also wanted to really kind of bring the outside in and kind of focus on that as opposed to um, having something that was a more traditional ins installation. And so the, the wall over there is um, constructed with um, materials and then covered with moss because her focus for the exhibit was the um, spruce fir moss spider, which is found in Linville Gorge. And some of you might 
be glad that it's rare because you don't like spiders, but it is a rare spider. We also have another spider in Limbo Caverns that's very rare. Um, and she, it, it, during her research, she found out about the spider and she used our exhibit to learn about the spider and its habits and its habitat. She did a number of drawings. She did some visits there. She did student tours. She took them out to the site and they looked at habitats. And so there was a lot, a lot in addition to the <laughs> exhibition that happened. The image on the right is from the National Wildlife Federation and it's a, a very large picture of what's a very teeny tiny spider. We also have a heather. I think it's a golden heather that only grows in Linville Gorge. This is Samuel Nigro. And you can see this is all one concept, but you can see how very different all these artists are. And that's kind of how my brain was working at this point, thinking from as many directions as possible. And his work at this point, that's the other thing the physical plant people said, is, oh, now we understand why the floor is a foot and a half thick in concrete so it can hold up this stuff. I think they were about three tons a piece, um, each one of those pieces. But he was um, doing performance work, um, so doing video and performance work while creating physical work as well. Um, and these were really connected to the idea of breaking stone, um, which he found to be this really kind of fascinating process and concept. So these are all um, broken stones and then they're pieced together. There's no mortar, there's no pins. These are all stacked. Um, very kind of like the Inca walls that you, you know, see when you look at the history, I'm a history channel now. So, um, so those are all stacked and you see how they're split in, in the ways that create this idea about how you break a stone and break, and so was, that was all his concept. And he actually, um, our first exhibition about the human figure, um, we have a, 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 a gentleman who's Sam Micro, so who's in um, Switzerland now, he lives in Switzerland. But he was in our first exhibition, and this was one of our 2005 exhibitions, and they both, um, we recommended them for Guggenheim grants, and they both received Guggenheim grants. So we're very proud of them and their work, and he's continued to have a really great career internationally. Um, this is Vinsky and Spanli. Um, they're German. I first met them when they were in the Rosen Outdoors comp competition, and if you did a Saturday night live sketch about artists from Germany, it would be these two. <laughs> so the piece they did in the Rosen was a refrigerator that they had made out of steel. It was a copy of a refrigerator. Uh, and so it, out on the hill, and Faye and John probably remember, there was this big yellow refrigerator out in the middle of the hill, and, um, but it was really the steel sculpture that just looked like a refrigerator. And um, it is also my favorite. Act, second favorite act of vandalism during my time at Appalachian. Somebody brought those magnets your kids use on the refrigerator to learn how to spell and put them on it, and I kind of left them for a little bit <laughs> before I took them down. But, um, but um, so I said to them, why the, this was, a, you know, I'm interviewing them, we're doing, why the refrigerator? And without missing a beat, at the same time, in the same voice, they both looked at me and said, because refrigerators are playful. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what that means, but that's working with these guys. So these are some of their um, installation work. These are all marble sculptures, and they call them Smurfs. And I tried to explain the whole blue Smurf. They didn't get that part of it. They were not up with the Smurf land. But, um, but these are all carved marble sculptures. And the one on the top right is hanging on the wall, which, I mean, we had to put in a steel system to hold it. But um, they are unbelievable. When you talk about surface tension of liquid, um, they're very scientific in approach. And so they are so quirky. And I mean, in, in the, our housekeeper at, at the time, she said, oh, I swear they're moving. I swear <laughs> they're moving. She, she did not like that. She would not clean this gallery until we were there because she, she swore they moved and followed. <laughs> so um, so they, uh, they, they were great. But you see, this was our exhibition that they funded as part of that. And um, they came and saw the exhibition. They were very pleased with the work of the artist. And as I say, one of these artists um, received a Guggenheim following that. And um, so after that exhibition, I continued to visit them, send them updates, um, reach out to them, share, share what was going on here. And I was invited to be part of the people on the bridge there or the folks from across the country who were invited to be part of this um, institute in, um, in the Cascade Silver, Cascade Silver Falls area of Portland. And never been there. It was beautiful. And uh, we were there like this whole time. I would get up and that's the picture on the left is from one of my walks. I would walk every morning and this, it's just amazing. These huge trees and it's green. And, so go there if you get a chance. 
Um, so after that, I came back to the Turchin Center, and we did a lot of work at this institute about what our organizations meant to our communities. Uh, we had people from Los Angeles all the way to Boone, all over. We had nonprofits, Project Row Houses in Houston. Um, I mean, you can name it. We had um, museums in Oklahoma, Kansas. It was just great. And so we all talked about our core missions, our values, uh, what we were doing as an organization, what we wanted to do professionally. So that all came back with me, and that was a time at Turchin when we did a lot of um, soul searching about what we were doing in our missions and our exhibits and talked through a lot of things and created plans and um, documented things. And um, it was a great time for us, and that was very uh, kind of um, critical in our, in our history at that point. It was a good opportunity to, for us to be able to bring in this information from all these organizations and see that no matter where they were, some of the things were really the same and um, that we could look for solutions or take solutions or give them solutions and it was it was life-changing so then um, then we got word after as you can imagine continue to send stuff <laughs> to them and keep in touch we were um, uh, uh, made aware that we were getting a gift from the photographic legacy project which was the project they gave to many museums across the country I think maybe 300 but there are a lot of museums in the United States and so we uh, got 152 original works in that group. And so those are a lot of the pieces in the exhibit downstairs. Warhol was an avid documenter. Now, I think part of that is because that was his quirk. He took photos all the time, constantly, hundreds, hundreds of hundreds, just took photos all the time. I also think it was a mechanism to keep something between him and the people. Um, because he was with all of these really famous people. They all wanted to be with him. He was around all these people, and there are thousands of pictures. And so they were all documented. The foundation kept them securely, and we got them. And so you have some pieces downstairs. It's really fun. That, um, they're called an unidentified model um, because nobody knew who she was when he took the pictures. And it's Iman, the, probably the most famous supermodel in the world, married to David Bowie for many years. And uh, we have Klaus von Bülow. Some of folks my age might remember Klaus von Bülow um, from the movie. And uh, Stephen Rubell is down there. He's the man who owns Studio 54. I saw Wayne Gretzky, if you're a hockey fan down there. So, um, so lots of people. So he was documenting folks um, with a black and white camera, but also with a Polaroid camera, too. And then the Polaroid camera also became used for his work, to create his work. And that kind of stemmed from his use of a... Um, photo booth. Um, so he would take clients actually who wanted something down to a photo booth in Times Square, which at this time was pretty sketchy. Um, it, yeah, the, most people taking photos there were not taking photos with an artist. Um, so he would take these photo booth pictures and use them to inform his work. So for our opening of this exhibition, we had a real photo booth person there on the right. Um, and then the one there on the, that you can see there, the little bot, there's one we made with a, with a Mac computer so that people could do their own and email it to themselves and have their own Warhol picture. So, um, so this exhibition uh, kind of tied in some of those things. Back in the back corner is um, our interpretation of the Silver Factory. When he first moved out of his house into the firehouse and then to the next studio soon after, he um, ran into someone else who had their studio and somebody had said, hey, let's cover your studio with silver. <laughs> Ten, almost everything was in tinfoil. And he liked it, so his entire studio was covered and I've got some shots later. So that was kind of our homage to his environment. We also have some music posters from the time period and film posters over there. Um, this is our photograph. It's called A Portrait of Our Community. And it's the, photograph, it's the piece we made um, from the photo booth. People could use our photo booth for free, but they had to give us one of their pictures. And so we have this in our collection and we put it out kind of regularly and you can see what all of us look like 20 years ago or whatever it was. So it's, um, but it's a great piece and it kind of pays homage to Warhol and how he worked. This is a kind of overview of the Silver Factory. Um, we had music and um, if you're wondering, yes, I still have that blue <coughs> velvet bedspread. It's gonna come back one day. They also commended us for our framing. We did our framing in-house. It was hugely labor-intensive, uh, but we saved gazillions of dollars to frame them in-house, and um, so they started using our specs to share with other people. The studio pieces, so these studio pieces and a lot of the ones downstairs is a mix. Some of them are just because if somebody came over, he might take 300 Polaroids while they were there. Um, now, if he was doing a portrait for someone, he might also take a number of those and use those as well. And you will notice in the portraits, at some points, he had people use real heavy white makeup 
because what happened was that would kind of blank out their face and their lips and their eyes and their hair would stand out. So sometimes he did that at more, um, and you can see downstairs, there's one person that it's like, it's really, really, so he would experiment with that, how to, when he made the screen print, he didn't want all the other stuff to show up. He just wanted like the, the lips and the eyes. And so he would kind of, kind of, it's kind of like white out, really, you know, if you think about it, because he was taking a photographic image. And the black and whites were almost all either direct um, documentation of his world and events and people. Um, they were not used as reference material. Um, we also did a section about Warhol as a commodity, um, things that are sold with Warhol on it, Warhol plates, Warhol socks, Warhol um, wrapping paper. Um, it's, uh, so we talked a lot about that, about his processes and how they borrowed from um, uh, screen printing from the, the commercial endeavors as opposed to being the more traditional art avenue. Um, so then after we did that exhibition, we sent them the documentation of the exhibition. And a number of years later, we were, um, uh, re they reached out to us and let us know that we were also receiving a collection of these large screen prints, which they're downstairs, they're really amazing. And I only had one hope. They, we, they, they didn't want people like lobbying for stuff. So, um, so you really weren't allowed to have any input in it. I might have mentioned 168 times that I would really love to have Ingrid Bergman. Um, and lo and behold, she was in the crate. So um, I don't know how it happened. But, um, but we have some great pieces, and um, it was um, a huge influx at the time. So we did another exhibition, and this whole exhibition was based upon the silver, um, the silver theme at the studio, the factory where he worked. Um, these are actually some photos of him in the factory setting in the working area and um, to kind of show off how we kind of played off the same thing with the pipes and the lighting. And um, Warhol is very confusing for people because he did a thousand different things. There are some screen prints that are screen prints on canvas. Um, like the War, uh, like the Maryland's are screen prints on canvas. One sold last May, it set the record, $195 million. Um, so and then there are screen prints on paper, which our ones downstairs are, which are usually more in additions. The screen prints that he did on canvas, he might hand color some areas or he might use only screen prints. So there are lots of different processes that evolved. Now, for those of you who have been around, this face might look familiar. Um, this was um, Florence Hecht, who was one of our summer residents. God love her until she was 95. And um, she um, was uh, one of the people who had Warhol paint her portrait because she was, um, he would paint these portraits for folks um, and that was how he made a great deal of his money. And they were $25,000 a pop. And so he would set up appointments, they would come, he would take photos and, um, and she, does, she would not mind, she's, as she's passed on, but she would not mind me telling you it was $25,000 because it's worth considerably more than she paid for it. So she felt very smart by that. So um, this, the, the um, image on the left is one of her Polaroids. And you can see she's one of the folks he actually used the makeup, the kind of pancake makeup to kind of, um, white, to kind of block out her features. And then the image on the right is um, is uh, one, of the, one of her portraits. And so this is my last conversation with Warhol, about Warhol with Florence. So she calls me, get over here now. That's, that's Florence. And I always say to her, I said, Florence, that's such a great picture. And she said, I've never taken a bad picture in my entire life. That's, <laughs> that was Florence. Now you know who Florence is. So I got over there and she, she threw on the table this, this auction thing. And she's like, look, and it was this image on the front of uh, Sotheby's auction, I think, in, or, or Christie's one in, in London. And, and it was her face around the front. And she's like, this is my face. They can't sell it. And I'm like, well, you know. So it, what it turns out is he did three of her. Um, and she liked two of them, so she bought two. And she didn't like the third one enough because he wouldn't give her a discount. So she didn't get the third one. And somebody else bought it. And it went to some co private collection in Europe. And it got auctioned off. And she, she, she thought she deserved some of that money. And I had to tell her that mm, it was not going to happen. Um, so she, uh, I said, well, Jeff, aren't you happy somebody wants to live with your face enough to pay that money? And she said, no, that does not make me happy at all. <laughs> so, so, but that's one of our local high country connections. <laughs> 
um, these are some more images of, um, let me put my glasses on so I won't lie to you, of Warhol working in the studio. These are screen prints. So the top two are him actually making a screen print. So um, it could be done on um, canvas or paper. If you see in the middle there, that's actually a screen print, one of his self-portraits, I think, that he screen printed on canvas and then it's attached to a canvas form, so it's a regular canvas. Um, the image on the left is one of the Elvises. He would also do paintings where he would project the image and trace and paint from the projection. So there, are, so when you see them, there, you know, people are often confused, and it's because it's confusing because he did lots of different things in lots of different ways. He was always experimenting with how to um, move the work forward and how to produce and produce and produce. He was very focused on that kind of how to make more of the same and alter and change. And this is another one of our exhibition pictures. So just to talk a little bit about um, the, the, the works. These works are part of the Turchin Center's permanent collection. So um, you see here the um, mission statement for the Turchin Center's um, collection. So one of the things that we were trying to do in nailing this down is to really um, to acknowledge that our job having a collection was to support the university's mission. To, uh, we're a teaching institution, so we need to build a collection that supports that teaching mission. So that shapes things in lots of different ways. It means you sometimes have to tell people no <laughs> um, when they want to give you things. And um, because you have to be very specific because there's a, such a limited amount of resources. So we had, we, one of the things we discussed is we needed core principles to be able to talk to people about um, the things we collected. So one of the things we talk to people a lot about and continue to, I think we have about 2,300, 2,200, something like that now. Um, so uh, we wanted the collection to be appropriately, and I think we started with about 30. Uh, yeah, back in the old days. In the, yeah, so and when we got to the church and it started at 300, but back before we moved to that building, it was, I think we had three. So um, we wanted to have an appropriately sized permanent collection to meet our goals through exhibitions, campus, and to loan out as external ones. So, an appropriate, so what does appropriate size mean? We'll talk a little bit about that. The collection is utilized for aesthetic and educational value as an offsite extension of the center's programming. So places like this, it helps us get the programming out and share and partner with people and um, be part of the art community. And then the last one is really the important bullet that we talk with people about. We want to make sure we can provide the long-term ethical care and preservation of all the objects that are at the center of the collection. Because if you can't take care of it properly and keep it, then you really should not be the steward of those works. And so, um, so we have 22, 2300, whatever it is around there. Sounds like a lot, and it is a, it is a lot. But um, we have collected things that were regional, national, and international in focus. Um, you know, it, there's some, I have a few pieces that someone purchased and they gifted to the collection that are in the collection. So my piece, they would probably put up in the Starbucks and be just fine with it. Warhol's not going into Starbucks. So there, there, there are levels of you know how risk assessment for the for the works. So some of the works you really need for more regional, local, institutional shows, and other works you need to be part of this larger um, world of loans.